Hey guys, welcome back. Um, I hope you are ready for a little bit of a different video. Um, as you can tell by the title of the video, this isn't going to be just a normal um, art chat. We're going to talk about art and health. And um, this has come up because after I made my art timeline video in 2019, I think it was in 2019, I shared a bit about how I had been diagnosed with um, a chronic illness when I was in my mid twenties. And that was kind of like the, not the catalyst, well, a catalyst actually. It was the, one of the things that made me like really go in, get serious about art. <laughs> and um, since then, a, a lot, I have received a lot of emails and messages thanking me for the video, but then also wanting to know more and wanting to know how I managed to make art, how I managed to work when I was going through what I was going through health wise. Um, and my normal approach for this kind of thing would be to like, <laughs> come up with my top tips or like a, a system, um, some way to approach it. Oops, sorry, silencing this here. Yeah, some systematic way to approach it, to take it apart and the things to do to make it better. I, I wish I had that to offer for this, but I don't. Um, all I can do is share more of my story. And um, I feel um, nervous to do that because um, it's an area of my life that's still, like even reflecting on it now, I still have a lot of like feelings of uncertainty and those feelings of like self-doubt and all that like come back pretty quickly. Um, and I'm also, yeah, it just, it just feels really personal uh, to talk about. And um, even though I'm someone who shares a lot on online and on social media, I do still have like a really strong, um, Ron Swanson vibe, I guess, where there's a part of me that's like, I don't want anyone to know when it's my birthday or, you know, what I had for dinner last night or why does anybody need to know that I struggled, um, that, ha that I had health struggles. Um, but I have decided to share some of that in the past. So I feel like if it can possibly be helpful to somebody now, I'm going to go ahead and share it now. So, um, before I start, I want to say two things. One, I'm going to try to just be as unedited, I guess, as possible. So this, this is just going to be a real conversation. And I have tried, I can't remember if I said this already, but I've tried a few times already to make this and have gotten caught up. And um, yeah, so I'm, I'm just going to try to push through <laughs> and just have a talk with you guys. And then also, uh, I don't know how... There, there may be some graphic or yucky descriptions of things because we're going to be talking about health and illness. So, um, and also, I guess the third thing I should say is I'm not a medical professional. So whatever I say, please just, I may be wrong about some terms or things. Please just cut me some slack and know that it's hard for me to talk about this. And uh, if you're using me as a reference or a source, like, don't do that. <laughs> just hear my story for what it is. Imagine I'm your friend having coffee with you and sharing that. And if you want to, like, really know how something works, then do some reading and Googling. And I'll have some, you know, I'll have some terms that, that you could look up in the description box. So, um... <clears throat> I guess I will just start by sharing how I got sick. <laughs> and uh, you may know if you've watched this channel that I did go to school for art and um, I graduated with an art degree. Uh, I didn't go to an art school, I went to a liberal arts college, uh, but graduated with an art degree and then promptly had no idea what to do with it. And uh, so that first year after I graduated, I was working as a tutor, an SAT tutor. And that means that I was like, kids who had to take the SAT who had maybe taken it already and hadn't gotten a very good score, who had gotten an okay score but wanted to get a better one, like I would tutor them and help them get better at taking the test. And um, kind of piddling, what a gross word, um, pattering, I don't know, like 
tinkering, that's the word I'm looking for, tinkering with art, not, you know, I'd have like an idea, I'd start on something, and I've talked about this before too, but uh, that I was in that phase where I would start on projects and then trash them, and, and that was just what I was doing. And a few months into that, less than a year after I had graduated, I, um, I uh, got this disease called C. diff, and um, I got it probably because I had taken some antibiotics for um, for a sinus infection. But if you don't know what C. diff is, it's it's a super bug, and it's one that is in your intestines, and um, it's pretty serious. And it's not uncommon, but it's it's common for people who are like 70 and older living in assisted care facilities or in the hospital, or um, it's not 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 common at all for younger people and um, <clears throat> especially like younger healthy people so I got that what seemed like out of nowhere and was like violently horrifically ill like I I, I do have some standards I'm not going to describe the kind of sick that it was other than to say that it was in the bathroom and it was a lot and it was yeah I've never experienced anything like that before or since and <clears throat> And I went on medication for it. I was diagnosed, thankfully, um, didn't end up having to get hospitalized, got a medication. The medication worked and then I got like tested afterwards again and was negative for C. diff. So that was great. But the problem was I did not feel better. And that was the start of just like a kind of a downhill spiral for me. It was the first symptom was abdominal symptoms. And at first I thought like it must be related to C. diff because I would have just uh, not constant abdominal pain, but basically every time I ate, I would be in agony. And uh, it got so bad to where I would just avoid eating. And I, I had lost a little bit of weight from the C. diff from being really sick, but um, because I was afraid to eat, because every time I would eat, I was in pain, I lost about 30 pounds in the span of, um, I don't know, like six or eight weeks. And I'm sure much of it was water or whatever, but it, it was drastic. And, um, and I was going to the doctor saying something's wrong, something's wrong. And of course they thought, you know, oh, she probably, maybe she has an eating disorder. I didn't have an eating disorder. Um, I was just terrified to eat cause I would be in pain every single time. Um, and, uh, I'm trying to think how much detail I want to go into here. Like basically like from that point, <clears throat> Um, that started like about three and a half or four years of me um, having some new symptom and you know the, the existing one would still be ongoing and then I'd have another symptom so like it started with abdominal pain and then it was fatigue like I was so tired I would sleep like 12 hours a night and then I would be you know on my commute on the train um, going into work and be like falling asleep going into work uh, I could basically sleep anywhere because I was so tired. Um, I had like major skin rashes and like um, eczema and other stuff besides eczema like all over. Um, I was like, extremely sensitive to hot, uh, to heat. Like I would, if I was at all warm, I would just be like sweating profusely and be like itchy everywhere. Um, like asthma, increased asthma. Um, I had um, like just this kind of fogginess and like I didn't feel sharp. I, I always felt like I was half asleep. Um, uh, bone and joint pain, um, nervous system stuff. Like I would wake up in the middle of the night and have from my shoulders all the way down to my arms would feel like completely numb. Um, <clears throat> and um, what else? <laughs> There were, I think there were like one or two other things as well. Um, all like hair loss, like weird, weird stuff and so many different things. And it seemed like so many different body systems were involved and they just kept piling one on top of another. And I saw over the course of those few years, I saw dozens of different specialists and doctors trying to get diagnosed. Thankfully we had, um, we were in Massachusetts. So for part of it, I was on Mass Health, And then for part of it, we had our own health insurance. Um, so that was, um, yeah, I'm, I'm grateful for that, but, uh, it was, um, just this constant cycle of like being sick, <coughs> excuse me, <laughs> um, 
being sick, like having like my symptoms get way worse and then trying to find help, going to a doctor and the doctor saying like, yeah, so I have an idea of what's wrong with you. And then they would run some tests and um, then find out that no, the tests were negative or inconclusive or whatever. And I had like so many like MRIs and CAT scans and PET scan I think that's like your whole body and um, barium swallows like multiple different tests with barium like I had to drink like an entire gallon sized jug of barium once um, more often I had to do the small cups but like I don't know like three or four different barium tests um, I had a colonoscopy um, just like every test you can think of lots of different invasive tests and they would always be inconclusive or negative and uh, and then at that point the doctors would say like well you know you must be depressed and I, I probably was somewhat depressed but that wasn't the the presenting cause and uh, or they'd say like you're on your period or you have anxiety or like um you know it's yeah, basically there's nothing, <clears throat> there's nothing wrong except that you think something is wrong. And then I would like feel terrible and I doubt myself and I feel like I was making, you know, a mountain out of a molehill and, um, uh, yeah, it was, <laughs> I can tell right now as I'm talking about it, I'm still like pretty locked up <laughs> about it because it was so, it was so traumatic and to have it happen over and over again and to have to feel like I, you know, I, I was afraid of eating. I was constantly tired. I was like, just, I felt like my body was falling apart and, um, and nobody believed me. <laughs> and I shouldn't say nobody because my, my family did, uh, thank God, but like my doctors did not. And um, trying to get help at that point was just, um, yeah, it was agony. And um, so I would go through that cycle over and over again, get sick, try to see the doctor. Doctor would think of an idea, find out it wasn't that. And then I would just be like despondent and give up on going back to the doctor. And maybe symptoms would improve slightly, but then they'd get worse again. And it was like this wax and wane, wax and wane, wax and wane. And um, shortly after that started, like shortly after I got sick with the C. diff, um, you know, after a few months of being undiagnosed, uh, I just like stopped making art and uh, getting sick was eventually the reason that I got really into art, but it was also the thing that stopped me from making art in the beginning. So if you are feeling bad, like, wow, I was, you know, I got sick and I just wanted to stop making art. I, I went through that phase too. And um, for me, what it was about was that I, I was just so knocked down um, and I was also in deep denial about the fact like of how sick I was and it, it's hard to accept something if you don't at least for me it was hard to accept it without a label so having <clears throat> being undiagnosed and um, and yes I could see like all these areas like of, of proof of evidence that I was sick but I wasn't diagnosed so it made it really hard for me to accept it so I was trying to work and um, I went from working as a tutor to working as a um, faith-based community organizer and <clears throat> that had pretty grueling demanding hours and it was very meaningful work um, and so it made me feel like I could when I was there when I was doing it I felt like I could sacrifice my body basically like I could say yes I'm in pain I am scraping the bottom of the barrel in many ways but like this really matters this is really important so I was able to I don't I don't know how I did it honestly like in the time I all I can think is that I was in denial and I would I would go through again these phases where it was much worse and then I would also, of course, have times where I'd call out for days on end or would have to flake on things because I was I just like incapable of getting out of bed. Um, but I was still like pushing through, pushing through, pushing through. And I couldn't do that with art. Like I, I could do it when it was when it when it was this thing that felt like, OK, we're, we're fighting for like access to education or um, healthy food or whatever, any of these things that seem like justice issues that are justice issues, it was easier for me to like, to, f to push myself through than, um, than it was with art. Like with art, I just couldn't, yeah, I just couldn't summon that. So I completely stopped making art. <laughs> and I, the last thing I would want is for somebody to, to watch my art timeline video and to get the sense like, wow, oh, she got sick. And then her response to that was immediately start making art. No, my response to it was to run in the opposite direction. Like 
the organization that I worked for when I was doing organizing, um, <clears throat> there were like regularly, there would come up like opportunities to do creative things, like to paint a banner or to design, design a t-shirt or do different things. I would like actively reject them. Like I would push them on other, other people knew that I had an art background, but I would say like, no, I don't do that anymore. Like that's not a part of what I do. And um, of course I was still like having creative outlets. I was cooking and like, yeah, mostly cooking. Um, but I, I had a period of, of a number of years, like three or four years where I just ran away from doing art and I refused it. And it, it was too, it felt pointless at the time, but I think it required too much vulnerability and like required me to sit with myself in a time when all I wanted to do was run away from myself and not, it required like a kind of dropping into my experience. And all I wanted was to fly away from it. Um, so yeah, that was those few years after graduating. And um, I eventually did get diagnosed and it really was pretty dramatic because I had been going all those years and been going to MGH. And then one visit, I ended up switching to a doctor at the Brigham who was like, I don't know, like mid eighties, at least he was very old when I went to see him and he's since retired. And um, he wasn't the doctor that diagnosed me, but he was the first doctor that I, that I felt like really believed me. And um, he read my record and he looked me in the eye and he said, uh, I may not be able to figure out what's wrong with you, but uh, I, if I can't, we will find someone who can. And the thing that really blew my mind then was him admitting that he didn't, he might not be able to help because every other doctor I had seen was like, oh yeah, I, I know what she has, I know what it is. And then when it wasn't that, then they'd be like, well, it's nothing. So for him to admit, to have the humility to admit like, wow, I, I may not be able to figure this out, but we will find someone who can. <coughs> I think that was the moment when I knew like, okay, something's gonna change here. And um, a few doctors down the road, like three doctors down the road a couple weeks later, that, so that was a short period of time, I ended up getting diagnosed. And um, it, um, well, I will tell you what it is. It's a mast cell activation syndrome or mast cell activation disorder. They were pretty sure it was a mast cell related disease because all of my symptoms um, were related to, um, to an over overabundance of mast cells and an overabundance of histamine. Uh, I am not going to try to explain all of that <laughs> because I'm not a sciencey person and we would be here all day, but, um, but it is one of those uh, illnesses that can just affect like every single body sim um, system and every single one of my symptoms was explained by it. And I basically was like a textbook case for it. And um, I was so relieved when I got diagnosed, so relieved to feel like finally somebody believed me and it's not in my head and like, it was like this kind of validation. Um, and I was also really excited to get on medication. And um, my, I didn't realize this beforehand, but after I got diagnosed and after I got on the medication, I, I quickly realized that I had been expecting that I would get diagnosed and like, then someone would give me a shot and I'd go back to being my old self. And I quickly realized that with this, that was not going to happen. And this whole time I had still been working um, at the same job that I mentioned. I've been working as a um, organizer and those weeks were, were like a average week would be, you know, 45 hours. And there were 50, 60, sometimes an odd 70 hour a week, but like it was, it was intense. And there was a lot of stress related to it. A lot of like really public facing stuff and being in front of people and having to recruit people and having to train people and public speaking. And like, that was pretty intense. And that's what I was still working in. And I continued to work in that for I'd have to look back and see, but I, I, it was at least six months, maybe a year after I was diagnosed. And then I was at an appointment with the doctor, um, one of my doctors and complaining about the fact that I didn't feel like myself. Like maybe I was having a few fewer, a few fewer <laughs> flare ups, but I was not back, back to normal by any means. I still had regular flare ups. I still felt exhausted all the time. Um, it was still being alive was still a painful experience. And, um, and he was pretty blunt with me and said, like, basically you're going to have to make, it's not, you won't be able to fix this just by having medication. You're going to have to make major lifestyle changes. So I, um, and he is the one who then recommended that I quit my job or, you know, majorly, majorly cut back in hours. 
And uh, at the time, thankfully, Eric had a regular job. Like a, um, we were both done with school at that point. He had finished with his graduate school, and so he he was working normally. Um, <clears throat> so I was able to to quit, and it was painful financially but we knew that it was what i needed to do to get into a better place and thankfully we were privileged enough to be able to do that um so yeah i quit and uh and that is when i really hit rock bottom and that's kind of where i picked up a little bit more in the in the art timeline story. So at that point I had, you know, been through these years and years of trying to get a diagnosis, years and years of acting like nothing was wrong and, you know, kind of being in denial about, um, about how sick I was. And, uh, at that point when there was nothing else to be in denial about, and there was nothing else to push toward and strive toward. And I was just home by myself all day, every day. Like, yeah, I, that's when I really finally hit bottom. And, um, and I only, you know, and you heard me say like how I had just completely eschewed any, um, attempt at art. I had pushed it, actively pushed it away. And, uh, at that point when I was in that, like, you know, the, the bottom of the barrel, the belly of the whale, whatever you want to say, like, that's when my sister gave me some art supplies and said, you know, that I, if Henry or Matisse had made art from bed while he was sick, then you can too, some version of that. And, um, <clears throat> And honestly, like that's why still today I make work with watercolor and colored pencil because that's what I could do when I was in bed. Um, so yeah, I, I started doing that and I started making these watercolor drawings and I've, I've talked more about this, so I won't go into too much detail here, but if, if you wanna hear more detail, watch the art timeline video, um, which I will link in the description. Um, what was I saying? Yes, so um, I started making just easy drawings. So this is the first thing I, I guess I wanna say like in, to the people who have asked, how did I do it? How did I, <clears throat> how did I make art? Sorry, I keep clearing my throat. I think, I think it's like a nervous response, but <clears throat> um, okay. The people who have asked like how I did it, um, I, I did it just a little bit by little bit. I didn't like get sick and hit that rock bottom and then get to where I am right now. Um, I uh, was just making like little fun watercolor sketches. Initially, I wasn't even using reference photos. I was just doing it from like my brain, just doing it to do it, just to have anything to focus on besides the pain. And, uh, and I mean that in like multiple ways, like the physical pain and the emotional pain. And, um, and I learned pretty quickly what I had known in college and then forgotten when I stopped making art was that making art is like transportative. Is that a word? Like for me, it, it was, it brings, making art is tr brings a certain element of transcendence and I could do, I could be making something and, you know, be feeling terrible, like in like physically feeling terrible and mentally, emotionally be feeling terrible. And if I could get into that flow state where I was making a piece of work, um, then I would feel, I would not that I would feel better, but that I would not be aware of how terrible I was feeling, at least for a while. It was a kind of escape. And um, <clears throat> that was what most of the first few months were. And um, after quitting, uh, my health did start to improve some. Uh, it took a while. It was None of this was as fast as I wanted it to be or thought it would be. Um, but I, I did start to get a little bit more stable. I was having fewer flare-ups. And so that enabled me to do a little bit more work. And I set up a, a home studio and started doing some stuff where I wasn't in bed and like was actually sitting at a desk, you know, not on the couch or, or in bed. Um, and um, yeah, and I was still, like I said, still dealing with flare-ups, but it was more stable. It was just kind of this like slow incremental journey to things stabilizing a little bit. And then in 2016, um, I, I don't think I have talked about this. Maybe I've talked about this before. I don't, I don't know, but it was around the time that I started YouTube. Um, I also started experimenting with and eventually going on a plant-based diet. And I wasn't a super, super strict vegan. I don't, I purposely don't use the word vegan because, um, 
I would be like, you know, 95%, 90%, 95% plant-based, but like if you know somebody brought food over or if I would go over to someone else's house or whatever, I would mostly eat what I was served. I can talk about why I felt like I needed to do that, but I, I'll, a, short, a short explanation is basically just I, it, I had so many major allergies and like actually a big component that I didn't mention of mast cell activation syndrome is that um, I had like major anaphylactic episodes to different things, uh, all different kinds of foods and um, had been, had had to go to the hospital for anaphylaxis. And um, if you don't know what that is, it's like a whole cascade of events that happen like when your body gets like overwhelmed by histamine, it's an allergic reaction. It's a life-threatening allergic reaction. And I had it to all different kinds of food. And then I even had them sometimes to nothing at all, <laughs> yeah, which is a, another symptom of, of mast cell activation syndrome. It's called idiopathic anaphylaxis. So basically I was allergic to so many different things. It was too hard. Like if in the rare event that I got to see a friend or somebody came over to visit me, like I, I couldn't bring myself to say like, also please, you know, make sure to not have any meat. Like it just, yeah, I, I just, I made that decision. That's what it is. I am, I guess I'm afraid in saying that I'm afraid that people who are vegan are going to judge me that I wasn't doing it like well enough. And I don't know. It is what it is. This is this is the risk with sharing really personal stuff. You guys is um, it does feel like I'm opening myself up to criticism. But um, anyway, that's what it was. And um, I uh, making that change, <laughs> making the change to the plant based diet. And again, please take this with a grain of salt. I'm not a scientist. This was just what helped for me. It made a huge difference within like 10 days of mostly eliminating animal products um i i felt like almost normal like almost like my old self like i found that i was sleeping only eight hours a night um like i would wake up on my own and refreshed after eight hours which hadn't happened since be well before i got sick and um you know previously i would do like 12 hours in the night and then still be exhausted so um, that, that happened and then like all these skin symptoms that I had, like eczema and widespread rashes and stuff, that all just completely disappeared. Um, it was, yeah, it was the closest to normal I had, had ever been since getting sick. And that, like I said, that was around the time I started YouTube. <clears throat> and then I got pregnant with Penny. And um, uh, so, in addition to like my health improving my as my health kind of stabilized and improved my I started taking on more work and my career started to grow and um, this whole time I also was like pretty regimented so like you just heard me describe how regimented I was with my diet like at home everything was very controlled you know there'd be a few times a month that I would eat outside of that but um, really regimented diet at home really regimented sleep no alcohol at all alcohol is a major histamine uh, degranulator it makes your body release histamine so basically anything I could do to minimize that I was I would avoid getting hot I would like not go to barbecues in the summertime because I would try to avoid getting hot um, the heat is another um, trigger so any, I like had identified every single trigger and like all the triggers I was trying to minimize. I was really rigid with my medication schedule and, and it did pay off after a couple of years, I was feeling like pretty good and it would just be an odd flare up here and there. And then when I got pregnant with Penny, um, I went into basically, I actually don't know if this is the right term for it, but like a remission basically, like a, a dormancy, a dormant period where um, I had no mast cell activation syndrome activity at all, like no flare ups even. And, um, and so then like the whole time I was pregnant, I was like doing even more and more work and like doing more personal projects and just like digging in. And, and that was like when, so like 2017 is when Penny was born. And that's basically when like, you know, it had been this kind of steady climb more like that. And then 2017, it like went way up. And, uh, and I think it was because that I was able to just keep um, working at it and putting more and more into it. And, um, <clears throat> I want to be completely transparent with you guys about this point um, because I think part of what is behind that question of like, well, how did you do it is like a wanting to know well, how can I, if, if, you know, if you're struggling, if you're in that place where you're dealing with um, a chronic health condition, wanting to know like how you can do it yourself. And what I hope, if I have a goal for this video, it's that I want you to not 
feel bad about yourself. I want you to not be critical of where you are right now. How much more time do I have? Um, <clears throat> I'm sorry, guys. I'm trying to be succinct, but uh, I um, since Penelope, basically, I um, since I was pregnant uh, with Penelope, I have not had any major symptoms. I've had like a few little blips here and there, but I'm pretty much in a dormant period. So anybody who is looking at what I'm doing right now and saying like, wow, like how could she do that while dealing with like constant physical daily pain? Like, I want to be perfectly clear. I'm not dealing with that anymore. I don't know. I don't know whether I could do what I'm doing right now when I felt the way that I felt before. I, to be honest, I think I could do a lot of it because um, I got pretty good at, at pushing through and a lot of the stuff that I do does get me to kind of like that transcendent emotional and head space. Um, but, but yeah, that, that's, not a, that's not a part of my daily life. Um, but what is a part of my daily life is I am... Um, am uh, constantly prioritizing my health. And it's a big thing I think about. And even though I am in this dormant period, this remission, if, if we're gonna call it that, like I am so grateful for that. And I know I have friends who, who are uh, dealing with their own chronic health issues and uh, have not had this, have not had the opportunity to have this interlude or this break. And I know that they would give anything just for a day of feeling normal. So I, um, I can't really express in words how grateful I am to have had this. Uh, and, I, and I know that I'm very lucky. Um, but I also live in constant, I don't want to say fear because that sounds so negative, but a constant awareness that it could return at any time. And that's what the doctors have told me. They have said, since I've been in such a long dormant period, it's the chances are good that it, if it does come back, it might be lesser than it was. And I personally feel like if it does come back, I know how to handle it and how to manage it more. But even though I am in a good place right now, I am still really regimented with my health. I am still very well acquainted with my limitations and I don't push myself too far. So I don't, I don't try to do crazy all nighters. I don't, um, I still eat. Um, you know, I, I did have a period after being pregnant during being pregnant when I ate, um, closer to a normal diet. I still ate a very healthy, lots of fruits and vegetables, but I did eat some animal products. But now that I'm, uh, since like last November, we've been, the whole family actually has been pretty, um, pretty much completely plant-based again except if we're at someone else's house um which hasn't happened really lately since quarantine so um yes that's a priority uh, maintaining that way of uh, eating because i know that helps so much sleeping well trying to reduce stress where i can which is the, honestly the big challenge for me right now but i am super super regimented with that and my health is always like a big priority and i uh, am, am aware of those limitations so um <clears throat> I'm scattered now of what I've talked about because I've tried so many times to have this conversation with you guys and haven't been able to, but uh, I'm hoping that it has made sense. And, and at this point I want to transition just to saying a few things. I don't have like, you know, like I said, I don't have the tips, the five things, the 10 ways to whatever. I don't have the concrete things that I can tell you, like do these things. And this is how you can have an art career while managing a chronic illness. But um, one thing, I don't know, there'll probably be a few things. <laughs> one thing I can say is what I just said, and that is to become very well acquainted with your limitations and if and when you are able to learn to accept them. And um, in my experience, um, I, accepting one's limitations is not something that happens really voluntarily. I don't, I don't know. Maybe, maybe other people have been able to do that voluntarily, but I fought it so hard. I fought any limitations so hard until there was no possibility to fight it anymore. And I think Maybe it's easier if you get sick when you're older. I, I don't know, like, because it was when I was so young, I felt like I was, it sounds awful, but like, I felt like I was entitled. No, it doesn't sound awful. <laughs> That's how it should be. I, yeah, um, I felt like I was entitled to be healthy. I felt like, um, 
yeah, every, all my friends are healthy. Everyone who I know is my age is healthy. Um, you know, maybe they have a few little things here or there, but um, it, it always felt wrong to me. It always felt like this injustice that I was pushing against. And, and I do think it, I do think it is a, it's a kind of, yeah, well, that's another, another video, but yes, it was something that I was constantly pushing on. And it wasn't until I was like at, at the bottom of the barrel or I had nothing left to fight that I could accept my limitations. So I don't even know if that's, if that's a good piece of advice, because I don't know if you can choose to do it, but, um, maybe, maybe this is a better piece of advice is that if you are in that phase, if you're in that place where you have been knocked all the way down and you are becoming acquainted with your limitations, then looking for what you can do within those. Because I think a lot of people, when they get to that point, um, and certainly myself, like there was a temptation to just stay down. Like I was so, um, I was so beaten down that, that it, it, what felt the most natural was to just lay there and to not try anymore. And I don't, I honestly don't know if I would have, if my sister hadn't, um, encouraged me to. So I would say what, what Carly said to me when she gave me those art supplies. And that is that you, you can do this too. <laughs> and I don't know what your form is. I don't know what your art process is, but think about it in a way, try to make it as approachable and small and little and precious as you can and just take one little bit of it at a time. Um, figure out what tiny step you can make within your limitations. So yeah, I guess that's, that is, that would be my only major piece of advice as to how you can, how you can have an art career and deal with chronic illness. And, and I honestly don't, like, I can't even promise that you could have the same kind of career that I do because I'm well acquainted with the fact that I, well, I don't know this for sure, but it, it's certainly the curves of like my career going up and my health going up happened like pretty much right in line. So if you have a, a kind of illness where it's not going to get better or it's going to get worse, um, then you, you may not be able to do exactly what I did. I, I honestly don't know. I can't, I can't promise that. But what I, I can say is that if you can think about and try to identify what little steps you can take and just faithfully follow those, something will emerge and it will be different than my life because it will be your life and it will be unique and beautiful to you. And, um, and I do, I do think that we, we make the road by walking. I, I don't know who said that. Somebody said that I should have looked it up before I started talking, <laughs> but, um, yeah, we make the road by walking. And I think that that is especially true. I think it's true for everybody. And I think it's especially true for people dealing with chronic illness. And each one of us is unique. Our circumstances are unique. And the only way to figure out your path and figure out what your art career could be is is to take those steps. So even if they feel inconsequential right now, even if it feels like nothing and you're still mostly just lying on the floor crawling, um, then yeah, keep doing that. <laughs> and, um, and I do believe that making those faithful steps will have, have an impact. So I'm gonna cut myself off and just say that this can be an opening to a further conversation this was imperfect. I, I definitely didn't say things the way that I wanted to say. And I, um, uh, yeah, <laughs> there's lots more to say. So let me know if this is something that you want to keep talking about and what you want to hear about. Um, this is still primarily always going to be an art channel, but, um, it's also a channel where I share my experiences. So I am, I'm happy to do that if it will, um, be helpful and encouraging to somebody. So, um, <clears throat> thank you for watching. <laughs> and, um, if, yeah, let me know in the comments if you like this video or if you want more like this, everything that I just said, thank you for your patience, you guys. Thank you to Meg for editing. Thank you to my patrons. Um, and thank you to the community here for, um, for being here and letting me share this. And, um, and this video especially goes out to everybody else who is dealing with chronic illness, uh, especially the people who are undiagnosed for a long time, uh, especially, especially the people who um, are young and, and sick. And 
are dealing with that particular tragedy. So um, <clears throat> I don't know you, but my heart is genuinely full of, of love and hope for you. And um, yeah, I wish I could hug you and I would hug you if we were, <laughs> if we were in person. But um, all right, you guys, that's it for now. Uh, I will see everyone in the next video. Bye.